20 things that teaching real life art classes taught me about students' mistakes. Let's talk about that in today's video. If you are a regular on this channel, you probably know that I have a background in teaching art classes. I did so for several decades. I taught everything from children to elderly people in residential homes. I taught private courses. I taught abroad on painting holidays. I taught people with disabilities. I taught members of art clubs. Well, you get the impression. I taught a lot of people a lot of things. In fact, teaching has been a huge part of my life. Now, it doesn't make me a better YouTuber. It certainly doesn't make me necessarily better at teaching you to paint and draw. But what it does do is give me insight into the mistakes that students make. And we're gonna go through 20 today. I thought it would be a good fun thing to do. And you can learn from the mistakes that I saw people making again and again. The purpose of this video is not to make you feel bad, it's just to make you say, aha, everybody does that thing. And then to find a bit of clarity and a way forward. So let's get started with mistake number one. And mistake number one is choosing a subject or trying to find a subject that you think will be easy rather than something you'll actually enjoy painting or drawing. At the beginning of my regular weekly classes, I used to put out, you know, whatever photographs of whatever subjects we were doing. Or sometimes we did real objects like flowers in vases and people used to scrabble around. Is this easy? Is this picture easy? I think this one's easier. I don't think there's any perspective on this. Oh, I don't like that flower. Perhaps I'll just move it to the other vase. And I was like, stop moving my flowers around. Obsessing about what's easy won't really get you very far. Of course, you don't want to pick the most difficult subject in the world, especially not if you're a beginner. But I'm here to tell you that the things that look quite simple, nine times out of 10, just end up being really difficult anyway. It's far more important that you pick something that you like the look of, because that way you're going to enjoy the process much more. You can always simplify a subject that has too many elements in. Pick the thing you like, not the thing you think looks easy. Mistake number two, and there's only a few things in this video that are actually about attending classes, but mistake number two is being late for an art class, or if you've perhaps taken a day course, or even a live online course, the one thing you don't want to do is to be late, because that first 20 or 30 minutes is the most important part of the whole day. Now, I sometimes had people say, I'd like to do this day course, Michelle, but I'm gonna to have to leave three quarters of an hour early to catch my train. No problem at all, by the end of the day, everything's winding down. But what you don't want to be is late at the beginning, because that's the part where the teacher is explaining the whole class or the whole course. Don't be that person that walks in 30 minutes late and then says, so uh, what, what are we doing today? Mistake number three is not checking that all your equipment is in working order before you start. Now this doesn't just go to real life classes, this goes to any project you undertake. You don't want to get to the point where you're putting your masking fluid on the paper and you discover that it's gone off. You don't want to grab your favourite black liner pen and find that it's dried up because it's going to push you into making decisions halfway through your picture that may not be the best decision. Either you're going to compromise and use something that you know you shouldn't be using or that's not working very well anymore. You're going to rush your picture, you're going to compromise on things, or worse still, you might just decide if you're working at home just to, you know, not finish that project at all. Just like if you were making a recipe, you would check you had all the ingredients first. You can't check you've got maybe every single color. You might choose your colors as you go along, but do make sure that all of the basics are ready to go. It's going to save you so much frustration when you're halfway through your picture. Mistake number four is starting to paint when your underdrawing is a little bit sketchy. You know who you are. I think we've all done it really. We've all had that kind of blind optimism that hopes that a little bit of paint might improve a bad drawing when in fact the opposite happens. It's far more important to get your underdrawing correct. I have a lifetime of helping people correct painting mistakes, but the one thing you can't really correct, particularly in mediums like watercolor or ink that can't really be completely erased, the one thing that you can't correct is a bad underdrawing. I see people on Facebook ask about this stuff all the time in art groups and they'll say, oh, there's something wrong with this picture. And someone will say, you know, if it's a portrait, they say, oh, the hair needs to be a little bit darker. Someone else will say, the background isn't bright enough. And someone else will say, I think you need to do the eyelashes a different shape. And I'm looking at this picture and thinking, your proportions are wrong. There is nothing you can do to improve this because the underdrawing is bad. You yourself know if you're happy with a drawing before you start painting. And if you're not happy with that drawing, don't start painting. It's far better to do the drawing again 
and save some heartache further down the line. Mistake number five is not taking breaks. I often say that beginners in painting and drawing, it's like they're driving a race car and they're going to put their foot down and they're going to keep driving until they crash it into a wall. Professional artists tend to take breaks, assess things, see what needs to happen next and just give their eyes a rest. Even if it's a five minute break, we're just staring out of the window. If we focus our eyes too close all of the time, they'll start to get tired. It's really helpful to look at things further away. So going for a walk can help. Also, if you just don't know whether a picture is finished or you feel there's something wrong with it, just taking a break and going back to it is going to help so much. Sometimes you find that, you know, a couple of hours away from your picture and when you go back to it, you immediately see the mistake you've made or you immediately see what needs doing next. Don't keep going and going and going until you're tired. And just like a race car, you've crashed your painting. Straight on the back of not taking breaks is mistake number six, and that's not letting things dry. So your break taking, if you're doing something like watercolors, is important because you're going to need to let things dry. Of course, if you paint in oils, this is not an issue for you. You're going to have to wait months for things to dry. But I see so many watercolorists and other similar mediums like ink making this mistake. I've even walked around an art class and said to somebody, that looks really nice. You'll need to let that part dry before you do the background. And they'll say, yes, you're quite right, Michelle. I'll walk once around the class. I come back to them in 10 minutes and they went ahead and put the background in and everything bled together. And I'm just like, oh, look, there's that thing I told you not to do. And they, they look at me and they say, I know you told me not to do it, Michelle, but I just couldn't help myself. Now, if you're working at home and you're not in that sort of slightly pressurized class environment, then if you know you can't leave things alone, then physically remove yourself from the room, go for a walk, have a cup of tea. If a part of your watercolor is damp and you put wet paint next to it, it will bleed across. It's just physics. Mistake number seven is too much masking fluid. Stop putting too much masking fluid on absolutely everything. You know who you are. People tend to fall into one of two camps. They either put too much masking fluid on everything or they refuse to use masking fluid at all. Usually those are the same people at different stages. They have put too much masking fluid on everything. They've ruined everything and now they refuse to use masking fluid because that's awful stuff. I'm never using it again. The truth is that masking fluid is good for very specific things. It leaves a very hard edged shape. It's only ever meant for picking out very fine details. It's not meant for reserving vast swathes of your paper. It's going to make things look unnatural. It's going to tear your paper. I do use masking fluid. It's a very good tool to have in your arsenal. But if you're chucking tons of it on your picture and wondering where it all went wrong, please think carefully about using it at all and take the time to learn what it works for and what it doesn't. I have lots of videos on this channel that will help you to make the right decision. Mistake number eight sounds rather silly, but I saw it happen many, many times. If you're carrying your art equipment out around town, either on the way to an art class or just going around your friend's house, stop carrying your art equipment in cheap, thin, flimsy plastic bags. How many times did I see a student come into class and say, oh, what happened to my best paintbrush? What happened to your best paintbrush? Is it poked a hole in the plastic bag and it made its way through the bottom of the plastic bag and it left your life. You don't need expensive portfolios. You don't need expensive art boxes. Just use a sturdy fabric bag because if you use a plastic bag, you're going to lose some of your stuff. Mistake number nine is painting important details of your picture all the way to the edge of your board or the edge of your pad or block. If you ever have your work framed or even just put it in a mount, that's a mat if you're in America, we call them mounts here in the UK, then what will happen is your work will be attached to that mat or that mount along the back at the top edge. It's called a hinged mount. Your framer needs some room in order to do this. I've seen so many people paint church spires all the way to like, you know, a millimetre from the top of their board. You might not believe when you make your painting that it's ever going to go in a frame, but you can't always tell. Sometimes stuff just works out a lot better than you think. Or something that you did just for fun, your sister suddenly wants to hang in her kitchen. Give yourself a little bit of space around your board. Now, if you work on stretched paper and so you've got tape around the edge, then you can, of course, paint up to the edge of that tape. The same with some of you that make that white border with the tape around the edge, then that's OK. But if you're working on a pad, a block, 
and you're taking important details right up to the edge of your picture, be aware that you may lose them later on if you ever want to put this piece of work in a frame. Mistake number 10 is not changing your water when you're painting for clean water when it looks like minestrone soup. I can't tell you how many times when I walked around an art class I came across someone who said to me, Michelle, my painting just looks muddy and murky. I can't seem to get my colours as clean and bright as yours. And I said, that's because your water looks like soup. Now, if you have any mobility problems and it's difficult for you to keep getting up and changing your water, then I do advise keeping a large jug of water and a bucket on your table so that you can just constantly put a little bit of water out and tip out some dirty water. It's not rocket science, but it is going to make such a difference to your paintings. Now, when you need to change your water is especially when you're going for colors that are completely different. If you're using sort of fairly related colors like yellow and then going into green, it's okay to use the same water because green has got some yellow in. But if you're painting green and then you're going across to pink or purple, you do not want to be using the same water. It's really going to mute and muddy up your colors. So before we get on with our next 10 mistakes that students make, I just want to remind you that this channel is fully cat approved. He's seen something out of the window now. He's seen something out of the window. I'm going to put him on the table. But we've still got the towel here. This channel is completely cat approved. So please don't forget to subscribe and like the video for more helpful painting and drawing videos and more grumpy, difficult cats. Mistake number 11 is not checking curves and angles. So you wouldn't believe how many times I've seen people's brains just play tricks on them. Your brain is not designed for making art. Your brain is designed for keeping you safe and it uses the information that comes from your eyes to keep you safe. It doesn't give a jot about which way up a convex or concave curve is. Whether an angle is up or down, it will just take shortcuts unless you take the time to look and what I like to do, especially with angles, is just place a straight line along. If you've got a small angle, you know, you'll be amazed. Your brain can tip it from here to here. And I've gone around and looked over a student's shoulder and said to them, oh, with your, your angle is um, going down when actually it goes up. And they say, Michelle, there's something wrong with it. How did I not see that? Now you've told me I see it so clearly because your brain is just taking shortcuts. So with angles, I like to get a longer straight edge, usually just a pencil or a ruler and lay it along that line. It's going to give you so much more information about the exact angle that you're looking at. And with things like curves, you just want to get into that mindset of double checking curves and depths, because as I said, your brain will play tricks on you. It will also make assumptions. So if you're drawing a house and it's very tiny, your brain is going to fight with you and tell you that this is a much larger object than it actually appears in your photograph. So make sure you always double check things before you draw them. Mistake number 12 is a bit like the water one really, is not cleaning your palette. Now, of course, palettes get messy and we're all going to get in a mess while we're actually working. But what I like to do is clean my palette at the end of each project at least. So you want to be starting a new project with a nice clean palette. I've seen so many people get into trouble when there's just sort of random bits of colors in their palette that they didn't even realize were there, perhaps stuck in the corners, and it changes and mutes the colors they're using. Just like checking your equipment, do start each piece of work with a clean palette. Mistake number 13 is obsessing about how other people are working, how much better than you they're doing, how much faster they might be working. Now, this happens in a class when there's people at the same table as you, but it also happens on the internet where everybody seems to be doing better than you. Everybody seems to be progressing faster. What can I tell you? You've just got two options. You can either give up completely or you can just focus on what you are doing and how much you can control because you can't control other people. And I'm here to tell you that regular practice and regular effort pays off so much better than talent ever will. If you're new to my channel, you might be wondering why there's a sword on my mantelpiece. It's because at the end of this day of filming, I'll be going off to teach martial arts classes. I'm a junior martial arts instructor. I didn't start till I was 45 and it took me 11 years to get that qualification. In my time of training, so many more talented people joined the club than me, so many more younger people, so many people with greater flexibility, bigger muscles, taller than me, better memories, better at everything, basically. But you know what happened? They all dropped out and left. And there I was. I just carried on trying my best and learning. 
Obsessing over how well other people are doing is just a rabbit hole that you do not want to go down. If you are in a real life class situation, it's far better for you to be drawing one apple for an entire two hours if that's what you need to do. Not worrying about the person opposite you that has a perfectly painted bowl full of fruit. Mistake number 14 is using a scale divider wrongly. These things were the bane of my life when I was teaching classes. There's nothing inherently wrong with using scale dividers, but almost everybody that came into my classes used them badly. Even my cat Gimlet agrees. They would let the screws loosen, they would start them in one place and then they would move and everything would go wrong. Gimlet is here to say, please don't use scale dividers unless you know what you're doing. And if you do use them, for goodness sake, make sure that they're not moving whilst you're using them. I've seen so many people, you know, refuse to believe their lying eyes when I was telling them that something was out of proportion and they were saying, but I used the scale divider. Mistake number 15, and I'm covered in cat hair. I think picking up the cat was a mistake. Mistake number 15 is drawing around real life objects when you're sketching them or painting them. I found this particularly when I used to put out autumn leaves. Now leaves are not completely flat. If you think to yourself, ah, oh, and people used to come into my class and oh, I know what I'm gonna do. I've got a clever plan here. I can just draw around that leaf. She'll never know. She'll never know I didn't draw it by eye, but I do know because it looks completely flat and lifeless now. Whereas in real life, it had curves and it lifted off the paper and it had shadows. It's never a good idea to get an object that's three dimensional and just flatten it on your paper and try to draw around it. Mistake number 16 is putting your hands all over your work. So one sound that I hated to hear when I was teaching was this one. And it's people getting razor droppings and you know using their fingers to rub them off, people leaning on their work, people getting their hands in their drawings, particularly with drawing, particularly with watercolor painting. Your skin naturally has oil in, you don't want to put it all over your paper. It's going to leave greasy, smudgy marks. And the worst case scenario is it can actually block watercolor paint and you won't even find out till later on. I once lent on the top of my, uh, my drawing board my stretched watercolor paper, and I painted a sky in later on. I'd had some sun cream, it was a hot day, I had some sun cream on my arm, and I didn't see anything on my paper until I painted my sky, and there were all of these marks in it. Handle your work by the edges. If you need to lean on your paper, rest on a piece of paper towel, and to remove eraser droppings, use a large flat brush. Mistake number 17 is using an easel for watercolors. Always somebody came into my art class with one of those nice little table easels or even a large easel and set up ready to do some watercolor painting. Watercolors run. It's not that you can't ever tip your work up, but you are much better to work flat for the majority of the time. Now, if you find it hard to draw on a flat surface, and I don't simply because it's what I've always done and you do get used to it actually, but if you find it impossible to draw, you need an easel upright in order to do your drawing, that's fine. But when you start your painting with watercolor painting, you want to lay your work flat. Now it can cause neck issues, so you'll need to you know, get up every now and again, do some neck rotations, give yourself a break. I like to work on a very high table so I'm not leaning forward too much. Or you can even stand and have one of those easels that you know is adjustable and tip your work flat and then lift it back up. But in general terms, easels and watercolors are not good friends. Don't use one in order just to feel like a professional artist. Watercolor is hard enough to learn. Don't add gravity into the mix. Mistake number 18 is rushing to finish. Now this often happens in classes that are timed. You've got an hour and a half, you've got two hours, you've got three hours, however long you've got. It gets to the last quarter for now and you think, I must just get this finished. Well, why must you get it finished? Finish it later. And I had people that said to me, if I don't finish it in class, Michelle, I will never finish it. Well, that's a choice that you make. If you rush to finish a piece of work or if you rush your work generally, you're never going to get a good result. Don't be thinking to yourself, well, I've got to start cooking dinner in half an hour, so I better get this finished. It doesn't matter if you finish it or not. It doesn't matter if you finish it in two hours, two weeks or two months. Please don't rush your work. It always ends badly. Mistake number 19 is listening to random criticism from people that don't really know what they're talking about and just make throwaway comments that kind of eat their way into your brain. 
How many times did I see somebody go home from a class really pleased with their work and then come back the following week telling me that their daughter had said it was rubbish or their husband said they didn't know why they bothered going to painting classes because they obviously weren't any good. I get really fed up with hearing this stuff. One of my hobbies is sewing. I'm in a lot of sewing groups and so many times I've seen ladies make a beautiful dress for themselves and then be completely deflated because their husband says he doesn't like the shape or it's unflattering. And let's be honest, how many husbands are fashion experts anyway and how many of your friends are art experts? Friends and family can have all sorts of reasons for saying things about your work. It may just be their own personal preferences. Sometimes they may even have nefarious reasons. Don't even get me started on the hurtful things that teenagers will say to you just because it gives them a bit of a laugh. At the end of the day, if you enjoy making art, then you need to be your own critic and analyze your work carefully and think about the things that are right and the things that are wrong. If you need a safe space where people will give you productive criticism and not throw hurtful insults, then you're welcome to come across and join my Facebook group. I'll put it on the screen. There's also a link in the video description. We all need constructive criticism, but none of us need hurtful insults. So please don't let it stop you from creating art. Mistake number 20 is probably one of the biggest mistakes and it's the easiest to fix. It doesn't take any talent to fix this mistake. And that's trying things out before you shove them on your paper. So many times I see people mix up a color and it's wrong. They paint with it and it doesn't look right. Or they use a technique that doesn't come out how they wanted it to come out. All of these things are easily solved by simply trying out things on a scrap of paper before you put them on your picture. If you don't know if a technique's going to work, if you don't know how a color's going to look, swatch it on a piece of paper first, let it dry, put it next to where you're working. There's absolutely no reason for you to take risks that you don't need to take and to do something irreversible to your picture when you could simply try it out on a scrap of paper first. So do let me know in the comments if you make all or any of these mistakes. You can also let me know if you know where my missing jigsaw puzzle piece is because um, I'm doing a thousand piece jigsaw at the moment, except that now it's a 999 piece jigsaw because Gimlet has been at the pieces and one is missing. And before you leave this video, don't forget as well to have a look in the video description. You'll find loads of free stuff down there. There's some free downloadable PDFs. There's some free courses you can take and you can also find out all about my paid courses. I've got lots of five star reviewed painting and drawing classes, including beginners watercolor and beginners drawing. And if you do need a little bit more help with your drawing, you can watch my most popular drawing video right now.